I guess I'd like to start by asking you about your familiarity with the Bergman um, television series. Um, very little familiarity with the television series. Uh, a sort of passing acquaintance with the film version, which I think Bergman himself edited together um, for the American market, because in those days HBO wasn't doing high-class mini uh, European miniseries. So um, yeah, I, I knew the. Uh, but movie version a bit. Um, I have since studied it very, very closely since I got the got the job and uh, was attempting a sort of impersonation of Liv Ullman until Trevor said that that wasn't going to work. <laughs> so s some actors uh, would be scared by that, or maybe wouldn't even want to go near it. But you felt that it was obviously very necessary. Yeah, I don't have a specific process for anything that I do. I tend to grab hold of the nearest sort of passing ambulance um, in, in every job. Uh, Mark, my co-star, Mark Baisley, hasn't seen it, uh, doesn't want to see it, doesn't want to know anything about it. So Do you think he'll see it when this is all over? I don't know. I, yeah, you'll have to ask him. It'd be interesting. I'd be interested to watch it with him when, uh, when, it, when this is all done. But it's amazing how, given that he hasn't watched it and won't watch it and doesn't want to know anything about it, what the text clearly forces you to do performance-wise. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. And when this was released in 1973, the, mm. the, the film at least, um, you know, the, the folklore goes that the divorce rate in Sweden doubled. Mm. But of course, nowadays, it's, it's totally commonplace. So what do you think it is about this play that makes it so still so shocking today? Uh, people still do get married. Um, and it's relevant to any relationship be it married or living together or any anybody who's ever split up with anybody anybody who's had parents <laughs> and i think most people um have to have there are a few people who need two parents these days but um it, it is relevant for almost any relationship that you can that you can specify if you have children if you have brothers and sisters you you know and if you know people who are in marriages and observe these things going on I imagine that when you first got the job, the, the elephant in the room might have been the fact that you know, you're working, of course, with Sir Trevor Nunn, who had uh, mounted the play before with his then wife, yes. whom he's since been divorced from. Mm. Um, did this, do, do you think, at least, if he didn't talk about it, that it must have affected the way he reapproached the material? Um, he said a very wise thing in the lunch we had before uh, we started rehearsal, which was. This play is about Marianne and Johan, and that is the only relationship that we're going to be discussing. And uh, no, none of our relationships entered the rehearsal room. Um, but yeah, it must have been strange for him. And when um, we delayed our press night, because poor Mark got very ill, he had a virus. And um, about halfway through the week when we went dark, waiting for him to get better, I did say to Trevor, it must feel like this play is <laughs> jinxed for you. And he sort of smiled wryly. <laughs> so if you weren't encouraged to bring your home lives into the rehearsal mm. space, what's it like taking something like this home every night? Obviously, I try very hard not to. And um, I'm a bit of a, a sort of, I, I overcompensate by saying this has no effect on me, that one is work and one is home. But I did find myself <laughs> saying a little more frequently to my husband, anything you want to tell me? <laughs> anything you want to discuss, darling? Um, but but uh, no, we, we seem to be, I mean, the other thing that the play teaches you is that you can never be too sure and you mustn't be complacent. So, um, so you know, but as far as I know, we're okay. <laughs> And uh, what of sharing the rehearsal space with the, um, the, the Lyd Wales Opera doing um, the Duchess of Melfi, <laughs> I believe, and you're doing this really heavy material? The Mid Wales Opera were doing Albert Herring, which is a comic opera by Benjamin Britten, and a company called I Strings Company in another room in the same rehearsal God. area were doing the Duchess of Melfi. So, yes, it, I mean, three more extreme... Uh, if you can have three extremes, I don't know. But anyway, they, these... Pieces that three pieces of drama represented the three extremes, and I would try and lean over quietly to to Mark and say, you know, I still love you. <laughs> Very opera from one side and blood curdling screams from the other. Do you get used to that, or is it just really hard to maintain a focus with something so it. heavy like this? 
unlike a sort of high pitched drilling noise, um, other people's rehearsals, the, the sounds vary. And so the level of inappropriate is variable and therefore more uh, disruptive. But it became funny and <laughs> it was funny. Since we're talking about uh, noise mm -hmm. in the rehearsal space, I'm wondering uh, what scene in the play uh, was perhaps hardest uh, for you and, or you and Mark together to find kind of the right emotional amplitude, the one that you kind of worked at the longest to really get that tone? That is That question is demonstrating to me what an extraordinary process it was because we really instinctively, I think, found the level together without any controversy. I think uh, Trevor and Olivia and Mark was uh, an extraordinary um, relationship in the rehearsal room and we, we really found the level I don't remember having to struggle. The main struggle was getting the lines down in the very short four week rehearsal period and there is a huge, huge unwieldy scene. And I think it might be scene 13, not that I'm in any way superstitious, but it is huge and it's long and there are chapters in it. And it's quite near the end of the play, so it tends to be the scene that got rehearsed late on a Friday afternoon when everybody wanted to go home. And I did get a little bit um, woman on the verge of a nervous breakdown just saying Trevor could we rehearse this scene first thing on a Monday morning when I don't you know feel like I, <laughs> I'm already dead I've already been run over by the steamroller a couple of times and actually it was in performance I think it's found its pace right at the right when you, you about three or four times you think the scene's going to be over and then it kind of picks itself up and they they slug away at each other again Will they, won't they sign the divorce papers? Will they, won't they, will they, won't they? And you think, my God, they can't change their minds again. Not again. Uh, they do. <laughs> they do. And it, you know, played wrongly, it gets a kind of growth <laughs> from the audience, but played correctly. And one night, I, a friend of mine, an American lawyer was in, and um, he was like, he said he was gripping onto his seat to stop himself standing up and saying, sign the papers or it'll end really badly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's what we want is, is, you know, the 300 people watching the nib of a pen poised over a piece of paper. Uh, when Marianne says that I mean, people live in the shadow of a single act, mm. uh, it's easier to see uh, with, with Johan because it's, you know, his infidelity. Mm. It, it's a clearer thing to kind of fathom out. But I'm wondering what that single act for Marianne is do you mind? I, I've got my idea, but I want to hear yours first. Well, given the scene it's in, and thank you for pulling that out because Trevor plucked that phrase out and said that has to uh, has to resonate with the audience uh, more than any other line. Um, for her, it's aborting her child. Because I, I actually, well, yeah, now that you said that, I feel a bit stupid because it's <laughs> obviously a much bigger thing than the thing I was thinking of, but I'll take a crack at it anyway. Mm. Um, I was thinking, because there's also the line where he says, you don't notice things. Mm. And I thought, well, is her not noticing things? Does she actually notice it? And it's, it's willful kind of ignorance on her part. Is that the Denial's mistake? Denial's not just a river in Egypt is one cliche. Another one is her own, some things have to live in a half light. She, another very brilliant thing that Trevor uh, highlighted was that she was married before and she lost a child. And she says in the very first interview, we weren't in love at all when she got together with Johan. And she was kind of on the rebound uh, and he was kind of on the rebound and there yeah. was a sort of safe harbor and when you, when you get together with someone when you're both not well, in some sense, what happens when you're both better? Uh, can you survive the changes that happen? And um, I'm not sure that I've answered your question. I think, that, yeah, the point about her is that she, it, she's dissatisfied but is prepared to work through it. And he is, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong, it's over. 
and I think those patterns tend to repeat in a lot of relationships, but not necessarily gender specifically. One person goes, it's not perfect, but I'll stick it out. And the other person goes, I'm great, I'm great, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong. I've had it, I'm done, I'm out. So between uh, the scenes, I forget how many chapters there are actually. 15. 15. Between the 15 chapters, we've got video footage of uh, the family life with the children mm. being projected. You obviously had to go out and film all that stuff. Mm. So I'm wondering uh, whether you did it all in a, you know, a day or two, and how important is that in building the inner life of the character? Um, it was very rushed. We had a morning. The children... So not even a day? Not even a day. It was 10 a.m. till <laughs> 1 o'clock, and then we went back to rehearsal and rehearsed in the afternoon. It was very rushed, but we had a great guy on camera, um, present company accepted, and, uh, and Trevor knew exactly what he wanted, and, and it was behaving like you do on a, on a home video. So in that sense, it came very naturally to all of us. Mark's got small kids, I have kids, and we, um, we just did what you do. Seeing you in a brother-sister relationship in Neil Reputes uh, in a forest dark and deep, yes. um, you know, that's an interesting relationship in that they're kind of similar age, mm. equal stature, but there's, you know, there's so much room uh, for, for differences. And I suppose a marriage is, is comparable in that way. Yes, yes. I think, I mean, we did a lot of work, uh, Matthew and I, with a movement uh, and acting specialist uh, exploring our childhood because your sibling actually is the person you know longest throughout your life you know them when they're born and unlike your parents you'll probably still know them at the end of your life um, and so we had a lot of ground to to kind of make up our, uh, on Matthew Fox and I so we did a lot of sort of um, sort of retrogressive work, which I thought was very important for that piece. But Mark and I just hit the ground running. We have, although we've never met, we have lots mm. of stuff in common in our you know, friends and people we've worked with and ways of working. And uh, yeah, we just, yeah, we just seem to hit it. So that's part of the passing ambulance I that it happens so, to yeah, be there, and yeah. you just, you just grab onto. That it. was certainly a passing ambulance that I grabbed onto, and and you know. The, the sort of we met at you know the characters say we met at university and we were in the drama group and the political group you know I can imagine had Mark and I met when we were 18 you know we probably would have been although I'm older than him and I'd have left university before he went there but anyway uh, you know that I it, it's not unthinkable that we would have had that kind of interaction was there anything from the Libute piece that you were kind of able to carry over into this um we, there, there was an on-stage fight in that as well, but that was pretty unchoreographed in the Neil Lebut one, and this one is very carefully choreographed. It, and there's a lot more graphic violence in this, and it needed to be really carefully worked out. Um, so yeah, I took from the Neil Lebut is get a fight director <laughs> and do what he tells you. Well, uh, talking about that scene, which is mm. uh, on the evidence of mm. the show I saw the other night, one of the most talked about scenes and certainly the most shocking and the biggest intake of breath mm. uh, in the room mm. um, when you were doing that night after night after night mm. let's say in the first week mm. you were doing it and you were having to hit that peak mm. um, every single evening does it at some point become internalized like a sense memory or are you always struggling to not struggling but you know what I mean to have to wind yeah. yourself up to that level the it's the winding up emotional stuff is, is harder, um, you know, where it is absolutely stated or clear that you, you are in tears or you are hysterical. Fights actually have to be coldly technical and the, the job is if you are highly wound at that point is to unwind and um, hit hit the marks rather than the actor <laughs> you see what I mean hit the marks rather than the mark um yeah you know you you, you have to calm the, calm the hell down and and do it properly and if you if there if you're on stage with a kind of headless chicken who's who's doing it all on emotion it's a very frightening thing 
So if it requires so much precision and you're so concentrated on that, are you kind of aware of the reaction in the audience, which is huge, I imagine, every time? Um, like a palpable thing? No, it's very much, it's very much like uh, martial art. You know, it's to do with mm. eye contact and uh, being utterly focused on the other person and, and not hitting them <laughs> for real. But uh, no, there's, there's a thousand technical things. You're watching corners of tables, where the blood is, you know, whether you, the chair is, has been knocked over or not. Um, no, not really listening. I'm aware, I, I'm aware of, towards the end uh, of a response to one particular blow that um, Mark plants brilliantly. Um, but um, on the whole, no, I'm, I'm little like snake eyes. <laughs> and uh, being that it is, it, it's a real kind of conversation piece mm. after you've seen is it, it for, be for better or worse, <laughs> yeah. uh, depending on who you see it with, I yeah. suppose. But is, that must be something that you're fascinated by, but not able to really um, ever find out. But is, is the audience reaction and maybe the, what the couples who go together to see this play are yeah, talking well, about it's afterwards? It's worrying. It's worrying. You know, I mean, I don't want to cause. I have did send an email out saying to friends, you know, don't don't come with your husbands or lovers because, you know, I don't want to, you know, screw up people's lives. Um, but yes, some of my friends and relatives have been very upset by it. Um, and I find the violence, you know, I am a feminist and I have very strong opinions on violence against women and, and violence and domestic violence of any kind. Um, women are not the only victims of domestic violence. And, um, but I think this play does explore how complex that is. It's not as simple as, you know, all women are victims and all men are aggressors. And it's interesting that the violence, uh, both verbal and physical, the verbal violence I found, you know, just as lacerating mm. because uh, there are these shifts in power and control mm. all throughout the play. Mm. And about halfway through, I realized um, certainly in Mark's case, or his character's case, mm. is that every time he loses control, there's this sudden lurch into obscenity. Mm. Yes, well, it, marking the progress of the, of the rows, it was an extraordinary process in, in learning the play, because you, you, know, you have to learn the kind of structure of a row. And that really is down to the woman who adapted the play, Joanna Murray Smith, um, rather more than it is down to um, Bergman, and she really did nail that. That ter she plucked out from the Bergman the, this terrible sort of route through domestic rows and yeah. But losing your temper, it's like it's it, like anything. When you lose control, that moment when you go, I'm no longer in control of my physicality or my or my mouth. But I imagine the heaviness of the material must be made a lot easier by the fact that you're working with someone like Sir Trevor Nunn. So c could you just talk about that experience in general? He just carries this huge confidence with him that he imparts to you. Um, no matter how at sea you feel, you know that there is, going, there is this sort of bedrock of experience. And the fact that the production existed before, we know it works, we know that this this is a functioning piece of theatre and his sense of theatre is just so innate and so intrinsic. He can just move people and dialogue and sets around in this completely instinctive way. But I say completely instinctive, but also built on vast experience and, and, and a passion for theatre. So you just, it's that sense of being in safe hands, which with material like this, if you were in the hands of a fuckwit with respect, it would be terrifying. Um, but, and you know, we had an incredibly brilliant and experienced stage management and um, crew around us and the best fight director in the business and, you know, we, we were very lucky to do something, you know, in, it, it, the, of this size in this space with, with these sort of giants of theatre is, is a very extraordinary combination. And were there any interesting uh, tidbits um, in terms of the fact that he has done this before? 
uh, anything he did radically no, different this I time? No, as I said, he left it. He he has uh, his capacity mm. to uh, to uh, concentrate on the job in hand without regard for any previous experience was uh, was impressive. I wasn't so good. I kept on. So you had to rein yourself. <laughs> yeah, in. there was a sort of imaginary alarm bell if uh, if you started pulling on any. Uh, exterior experience and I rang that bell a few times but he never did. And uh, w when this play wraps up it just seems you're busier than you've ever been before in terms of well, film. Well the wonderful thing about film is that there's this delayed reaction. You, you work your ass off and then you go away for a year or so and see your kids and rebuild your marriage and uh, and then the movie comes out and people think you've been think you've been terribly busy in fact I've had quite a lazy year this year other than uh, scenes from a marriage eight times a week I haven't done a lot of filming yeah, lazy yeah <laughs> yeah you lazy woman but um, but no I the, I'm very lucky I've got four movies in the can and I'm hoping they're gonna see me through the lean period after this job finishes well, I just finally wanted to ask you briefly about a couple of those. Um, I'm particularly excited about uh, Last Days on Mars. Oh, good. Uh, and I think many of your fans will be because mm. it's a genre effort and, you know, mm. Below is, is one of your kind of uh, most popular films, I guess, in, in a, a more cult sort of way. Yes. Um, so it just, the, just w was it kind of thrilling and exciting to return back to genre stuff and science well, fiction? Well, it's both Below, I'm sorry to be a bore and a pedant, but both Below and last days on Mars were phenomenal scripts. I mean, the underlying ghost story of Below, um, it could have been in a spaceship, but it was in a submarine and vice versa for last days on Mars. They were both great stories in terms of who is doing what to whom, what's the underlying um, mystery. And also the, they were character pieces, each of these characters exposed to this, you know, this one, a submarine you can't get out, you know, a, a space pod you can't get out and something is picking you off one by one what is it and why and as an actor that's just a gift you just go yes please and you know the the assorted characters in both I I got to play a character that you know as a 40 year old year old woman you know you don't, these things don't come along like that I mean Kim from last days on Mars she's just fantastic absolutely without any you know um, peripheral vision on mission not nobody's going to mess with her and there's one other crew member who wants to bring her down and then I got to work with you know Liev Schreiber who is just an astonishing actor I mean really great and um, the other thing I'm ashamed to say but we were filming in Jordan and I got <laughs> I got to go to Petra someone else paid for me to go around Petra on a horse so yeah it's great Mars was the was the Jordanian desert. And I have to ask you, um, just because I'm such a fan mm. of uh, Romela Garay and mm. the fact that she was pregnant. At I the time. know. No, that was actually brutal. That was, uh, you know, ha ha ha. In actress, the a actress, you know, takes a job and is pregnant. And what a great anecdote. Not funny. You don't feel good the first three months of pregnancy. You feel very sick all the time. And any contact with your belly is really makes you feel nauseous and she these spacesuits were not funny and we were in the desert running up and down sand dunes I really felt for her and she did suffer but she she's brilliant and you wouldn't know to see it there are a couple of scenes where you look she looks like she might be sick but um that's Space kind sickness. of <laughs> yes it's kind of appropriate for the scene that she looks a bit queasy but man she suffered yeah so after doing something like this which is kind of well I find it enlightening as, mm. as much as I do depressing, I suppose. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if we want to label it that way, mm. I suppose working with Arnie <laughs> at the, the opposite end of the spectrum, is that what you're looking for after well, do, doing something like this? I'm going back to my tedious, bleating on David Eyre, wrote the script, Training Day, and he was directing it. And I met him and he wanted me to play this role. And he said, incidentally, <laughs> The character playing Breacher is Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was like, okay, that, that, that so this changes. So after you've read the script. <laughs> yeah, that, and that, that, change, that changes it, but yeah. So no obvious Arnie one-liners in the script? Well, there might be now. There weren't when I read it, but it's been re-edited a couple of times since then. I have to ask you about working with a master like David Cronenberg. So excited for this film. 
I was a bit scared because I, I actually can't watch many David Cronenberg films because I'm very squeamish. So I was like, what kind of crazy, sinister man is this going to be? And do I want to be alone in a room with him? The nicest, gentlest man in the world, completely charming, such a maestro. I mean, his set is like sort of Zen monastery of creativity. And I had a great time, quite a small part, but just hilarious script, so dark and so funny. Um, Mia Wasikowska and, you know, John Cusack, just, and Julianne Moore, twice in a year. I was so lucky to work with her again. So, yeah, very, I'm very excited about that. Really. Which brings me nicely round to <laughs> Jeff Bridges, because, yes. of course, Julianne Moore was on uh, The Seventh Son yes. with you. Um, any Jeff Bridges stories? But he I mean, told me this lovely story. We were looking at continuity photos and re re reminiscing about the days when people took um, Polaroids. And he said his old friend, who had done all the continuity on his movies since he was in his 20s, had sent him a continuity photograph of him from a very early movie that he shot in Montana. And it was of him in a diner talking to a waitress in a diner who was the real waitress in the diner, not the actress waitress. And he was chatting to this girl. And he said, I remember talking to her. And I asked her out on a date and she wouldn't go out on the date with me. And she, it was a tiny town, and they were in the, in the town for weeks. And then I invited her to the rap party, and she wouldn't come to the rap party. She came to the rap party, but wouldn't go to the rap party with me. And he said, this girl, I couldn't get her out of my head. And I went back to the town and asked her out, and she thought, because, you know, three attempts, and he's come back from LA to talk to me, he must be a good guy, and they're still married to this day. But the point about the photograph is that in a movie, you can have a photograph of the first moment you met your future wife. And it is an extraordinary, he said, there's this record of the first second I set eyes on my wife. That's incredible. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So, yeah. I, yeah, Jeff and I got on very well. He's a delightful man. So after this, is there a, a long break of deserved? I don't know. Send me a script, and I'll and I'll uh, and I'm so I'm so cheap. I'll probably do it. <laughs> well, best of luck with the play. It really Thank is fantastic. You. Thank and, uh, you for coming. To Thank it again. you. Tell your mates.